right. Good morning, everybody. You may be seated. Good to see you. We could dismiss the children, the children, the little ones to Children's Church. So glad you're here. You said, I can hardly come out. Come on in. Have a seat. I can hardly express to you this morning. I know you can feel it. But I mean, just personally, I can hardly express how I feel so blessed to be part of this church and all that God is doing in our midst um, these days. Last week was incredible, and the experiences and the stories I've witnessed this week, um, in the midst of all that's swirling around out in the world, I'm so encouraged. I can't even tell you how encouraged I am um, by what God continues to do for his people. That's just how God moves. Our church family is experiencing a number of breakthroughs in their finances. Several have um, had family members that were miraculously healed. Uh, there have been a number of job promotions in just the last 30 days. And someone, uh, some have acquired land, another inheritances, and miraculously, David's brother, who was on a ventilator, and they were, I mean, we were praying praying him out of here almost. Uh, but we believed and we stood and said, no, he's getting back up. Now he's walking around, talking to his mom, doing better than he's ever done. He's out of the hospital. God is really moving. The Bible says that um, the prayers of righteous people availeth much. And so your prayers matter, your giving, everything you're doing matters. And uh, as you heard last week at Miss June's, the Holy Spirit was moving in her, in her life group there. Um, right out of the book of Acts, it was like a scene from the book of Acts. June kept saying, you had to be there. That's what she kept saying Wednesday night. You just had to be there. It's hard to explain spiritual things sometimes when people aren't thinking spiritually. But uh, And Mark Keel's doing much better. Put your hands together for him. Uh, his uh, remarkable, yeah. And s s some of the newer family members have had remarkable windfalls. And um, So anyway, God's been moving to restore the church, not just to surviving, but thriving, um, flourishing in the riches of Christ. I was even blown away. Uh, I don't know if I should mention it, but our bookkeeper mentioned several that had given generously above their tithe, and then even others that have really begun to trust God, <laughs> to just really trust God. It's, it's inspiring for me to see that people have begun to consistently give again, to consistently um, get over their strife again, and just really take our faith out of what the world and Wall Street says and DC says and put our faith in what God says. And so um, I'm telling you today, friends, when we graduate from no longer depending on what the world gives and placing our faith in God and God alone, you know, that's when blessings start. And many of you have already been part of that breakthrough. And so, you know, I want to make sure I'm clear in this church, no one can buy a miracle Okay, we're not selling miracles here, okay? But the fact is, is that when you faithfully give back to God the portion that he has given you, what happens is you can't help but be blessed. I mean, the Old Testament, you know, I don't talk about giving very much, the offerings in the back, and you're a giving church. But we have a lot of new folks that I want to be part of the party, okay? <laughs> I want you to understand that you can't outgive God. And what's interesting to me is the Old Testament and the New Testament both say, both that you give 10% of what he gives you out of your heart and you pray and follow his word, attend church. And when you do this and you can expect from God, when you pray, when you're faithful, you can expect favor. You can expect blessings. You can expect, wait for it, wait for it, prosperity, God's way. <laughs> This isn't about name it and claim it. This is about saying, I place my faith in you, God. I vote for your kingdom, okay? You have given us this, but I trust you to increase me. Because that's what God's trying to do, is increase his kingdom in the earth. And so God's with you. Um, he wants you part of his party. Welcome to the party. And um, anyway, uh, his blessing rests on the faithful. That's what I wanted to tell you today. Look at this scripture because I, I, so many have been receiving restore, restorations and healings and new jobs and deliverances and promotions. Even Wednesday night, um, we had a prayer. We have prayer here every Wednesday, by the way, those of you that want a little extra. And someone that was there, I won't say her, her name. She said she's still shaking from what happened in a good way. She's still <laughs> releasing some of the pain that years had built up on her. Do you realize God is not, um, he doesn't need us. 
He, he doesn't need us. He wants us. He wants you. Now, you could go down the street and hear about mean old God. But if you come here, we're going to invite you into the intimacy of God, a God that created man for relationship, for relationship with him. That's what all being is. Being makes an impression of communication with one another. I better not get into that because we have a speaker today. But I, I want to tell you that look at this one scripture as I leave. And this is about the blessing that is on you. It says this in Deuteronomy 28. The blessing of obedience. Look what God promises. He says, now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord. And here's the part I like. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. All your flocks, you guys, all of you that are farmers out there. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you, shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Is anybody getting encouraged? Verse 8. The Lord will command, listen to that, the Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord is giving you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And then he says this, which the Lord has given you. And he says this, the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. For him, we're for him. Just as he has sworn to you, if you keep my commandments, the Lord your God, and walk in his ways. I love it. <laughs> walk in his ways. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. Gas can be $7, $8, and the Lord will provide. Do you understand? <laughs> I heard a crazy preacher say once, if bread, he had a real thick country accent, he said, if bread was a million dollars tomorrow, you'd have a million dollars. Now, you may not have it today, but tomorrow it'll be there because faith is something that we step out on. Amen? So uh, that's all I have to say for you today. But um, the good works that you do, um, they're, not, they're not the end all be all. What, what matters is when you wrap your good works with faith. When you wrap your giving, your generosity with faith, your prayers. Faith is what is the difference. And today, um, speaking of faith, I'm so blessed um, because... God has added to our church um, a special couple, Sean and Hannah. In the last six, seven months, they're two of the most centered and passionate Christians I've ever met. And I've asked Sean to speak today to tell you a little bit more about the ministry that he and his wife have carried over from their uh, almost a decade in China um, to literally minister through Momentus, which is their life ministry up at Glorietta, to minister to college-age kids, to kids that are in that gap year between being a senior. Remember that? When you knew everything, you were a senior in high school. That gap year, and they've been doing that. They've been raising all of their own um, support, and that we as a church have been, I've chosen, you know, with the trustee, with the uh, management team, to go ahead and give them something every month to help them survive. They're doing so much around here. And so I want you guys to pray about doing more for them. And today I'd like to bring Sean up, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about what is on his heart, one, with the ministry that he's de dedicated his life to. Um, and all the stuff he's done for us has just been incredible. And we'll, you'll see in the fall, we're about to um, unfurl some really uh, powerful initiatives. Greg said to me, um, the other day, Sean, he said, you know that movie with Tom Cruise? I said, yeah, you, Top Gun? He said, yeah, that one. <laughs> he said, I think we're stepping into the danger zone. <laughs> and that's what I think we're doing. We're, we're, we're not going to be a church just in the four walls. We're going to get out and make a difference. Amen. So let's welcome Sean up today, anointed man of God, to share his heart with us. Put your hands together right now for my dear friend. Thanks, Sean. 
Thank you, sir. You. you could have kept preaching. Oh, yeah. I don't want to. Same gospel. I don't want to miss it. We're doing the same. We're talking about the same thing. So, yeah, like he said, um, I'm going to share a little bit about um, the our full-time ministry that we're doing um, and how a lot of, well, a lot of what we do, our, our mindset with how we do things come out of China. I'm drinking hot water right now because um, it's a very Chinese thing to do in the middle of, like, the heat. You just drink hot water, and it makes you feel better. It's, it's weird. You get used to it, though, and it's, I, I still love it. Um, so, yeah, we do, so we did ministry in China, and a lot of working with young adults and discipling them, raising them up to follow Christ. Uh, and then COVID, uh, which God was not surprised by at all. Um, and he had a plan for us to come back to the States when COVID started. And uh, at the time, we were just, we thought we were coming back uh, to have Lana, our two-year-old. Um, but that wasn't his plan for us. As we, as we kind of experienced life back in the States and zoomed out and saw all these little things pointing us uh, to the fact that our mission in China was done, that what we were doing there was, that was, that was it for us there. Our assignment was over, and we were called back to the States. And so we started looking for... Uh, a new placement, and I applied a lot of places, a lot of places, 50, 60 places, um, all kinds of jobs. I'm not, I'm not too picky, because um, I just want to serve the Lord, and I want to disciple people. I want to equip people. Hey, there's an interesting phrase, isn't it? I want to equip people for the work of the ministry. That's the vision that God has put on mine and Hannah's heart to equip people, and so we started applying for places, and a lot of no's, because 50 or 60 places, obviously, they didn't all say yes. Um, and so I came across uh, this ministry, Momentous, and I thought it looked really interesting. Um, I wasn't sure if it was exactly the right fit for us, even though it was so much of it is when I talked to my friends from college, and I explained what I'm doing, and they're like, yeah, they made a job for you. Like, they just created it for you. And as I was looking into it, and I got onto the staff page and saw my mentor from college was the program director. So I called him up and talked with him for two hours or so. And I got off the phone and I was talking with Hannah about it. And again, 50, 60 jobs at this point I've applied to. And Hannah says, this is the most excited you've been about anything that's come across your plate. Uh, and so we spent a couple weeks praying and fasting and felt like this is the direction that God wanted us to go. So I'm talking a lot. What is Momentous? What, what do we do? So we are a college discipleship program. So students sign up to whatever college they want to. They could be going to UNM. They could be going to someplace out east. They could be going anywhere they want as long as they are able to do online college. That's their college, but they're attending our campus. So they're doing college online wherever they want, but they're living in Glorietta uh, with us doing discipleship programming. So they're doing their online classes for part of the day. The rest of the day, they're doing discipleship in Christian worldview, apologetics, spiritual disciplines, how to study the Bible, all these things. But then, you know, Rocky Mountains. So we're, we're out enjoying uh, the wilderness, doing outdoor ministry uh, while we're doing it, which is helping shore up a lot of the principles that we're teaching them. Um, because this real-life experience of, of needing to walk yourself down a 200-foot cliff face um, that's an exercise of faith, faith in the rope, faith in the person that tied it, um, and it's, it carries over into, we can talk to them about, what does it feel like to trust God? What does it feel like to trust God when we were doing ministry in Asia for a long time, and COVID started, and we have a one-year-old, and we're stuck in Thailand? What do we do? Faith. So that's, that's what we do now. That's, that's our ministry for the time being, is, is working at Momentus, helping meet this need. Um, some of you might have heard this statistic before, but 70% of church youth, so these are people that grew up, went through the whole church system. They were in Sunday school. They attended youth group. 70% of them will walk away from Christ by sophomore year of college. 70%. I got three kids statistically, two of them will stop following the Lord. Statistically. And I don't speak that over my kids. But statistically, <laughs> that's a lot, right? 
So we want to stand in the gap for that. We want to help equip them with what they need to understand their faith well and how to share that with others and equip others to do the same thing. Um, so that's, that's what we do, and, and it's really our heartbeat is to equip people to do this type of thing. We, we teach them how to share the gospel, and that's something that, that we're hoping to bring here as well. We teach them how to spend time with God. That's something that we hope to do here. There's so, there's, there's so much that carryover between what we're doing at Momentus and what um, the vision uh, that Guy has, that the church has, that we're coming alongside with of equipping the church to do the work of the ministry. Uh, and so that's our goal. And like uh, Guy said, we raise our own support to do that. Um, we're a startup company. Um, it's only been around for three years. Uh, and so we're just, we're, we're making it. We're making it. God is faithful and he's bringing in the students that we need. Um, but we raise our own support to do that. Uh, and so one of the things that we need is uh, partners for people to come alongside of us and partner with us monthly uh, to help support the ministry that we're doing there. Um, if we had 20 people that agreed to give $100 a month, we would be, our support would be finished. We'd be all the way up to where we need to be. Um, because we, we raised support for what we were doing in Asia with living in the middle of a city in a, like, 2,000 square foot apartment for like $300 a month <laughs> to America. Uh, and, and with inflation and with continually adding kids, they just keep, seem to keep coming. Um, we need to raise more support. And so I, I want to ask you guys, if you guys would prayerfully consider joining our support team, um, please come and talk to us after uh, the service, or for anybody that's watching online, I'm going to have uh, Jenny throw uh, my email address up on the screen for you guys. Um, if you're wanting to hear more about what we're doing um, and ways you can partner with us, we would absolutely love to talk with you. So uh, please get in contact with us, and we'd love to talk with you about what that looks like um, to partner with us in, in, this, in this really important ministry um, in helping, helping reach America, because that's kind of where we're at. <laughs> Uh, so that's, that's my pitch. Okay. Hi, I'm ready to preach my sermon. How are you guys doing? Let me pray. God, thank you so much for today. Um, and I ask that you would speak through me, Holy Spirit, that you would um, help me focus on the things you want me to focus on. And Lord, that you would speak clearly through me to everyone here. In Jesus' name, amen. So today I want to preach on, we're in this identity series um, wonderfully made. And I want to preach on what I, th what I think is the core of our identity in Christ. And to do that, I think a really good analogy for what that looks like, and an analogy we see in Scripture a lot, is the analogy of marriage. Uh, when Hannah and I got married and we signed our marriage covenant, um, we did not sign it so I can go buy groceries uh, for our family. Uh, we didn't sign it um, so that I can, you know, do the things that I need to do so she can do the things to serve me and back and forth. That's not the reason for a marriage covenant, right? The reason is intimacy, a desired intimacy. And our intimacy, intimacy isn't grown through those things. Our intimacy is grown through connection, through time together, um, and that can be little moments, that can be mountaintop moments. As I was prepping for this, uh, and I was thinking about mountaintop moments, almost all of mine and Hannah's mountaintop moments actually involve a mountain. Um, my 25th birthday, um, we had just gotten engaged, and we went to this mountain uh, outside the city we were living in. We were climbing up the backside where, like, there's a lot less tourists. And there is this, halfway up the mountain, there is a ferry to take you across this this chasm of water that you have, and you have to wait for this ferry to come, and it costs like 50 cents to cross, and you, you, you're on the, on the top of a mountain almost, and you're taking a ferry across water. It was, it was such a cool experience. Um, we would go to Thailand every year for our yearly retreat, and one year we rented a motorcycle, and driving on those left-hand driving roads, um, we drove up a mountain, 
and and looked over the city that that we were we were staying in and it was it was just a really cool moment for us even we when we got engaged we didn't get engaged on a mountain um, but we got engaged on the top of a uh, a 32 story building is that right yeah about 32 story buildings so it's kind of like it's kind of like a mountaintop it's like the mountains of the city um and there's, those are really important moments for us, but it's also the everyday stuff. It's when we get the kids down for sleep, sitting on the porch together and just talking. Um, or we started to, every, every few nights, we, we throw the Frisbee back and forth. Um, it's just a time, time to connect. Or when one of us is out, out for the whole day and we'll text each other and just random text saying, I love you, or, or something like that. That's the stuff that makes intimacy. And that's how we make intimacy with God, and that's where identity is. It's in intimacy with him. This is part of our purpose. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever, to enjoy him forever. This is the chief end of man, to have lasting, intimate relationship with him. And I want to show you that there is more. There is more of that for each of us. No matter where you are at in your walk, there is more for you in this area. More than, more than just doing things for him, more than just avoiding sin, relationship. And this is Bible-wide. This is, the whole, this, is, this is the whole message of Scripture. So I want to start by walking through the Old Testament, starting all the way back in Genesis. Genesis 3, right after Adam and Eve sinned, and it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of their garden. The first thing that they do after they sin is hide from the presence of God. It's the first thing they do. Which means that the product of sin is separation from God. And the purpose of of, of us is to have relationship with him. And, and a lot of scholars talk about this verse as, uh, talking about it being, you know, this is the habit of God during this time in the Garden of Eden, of perfection, of him being in the garden, walking with Adam and Eve, talking with them. Genesis 18, we come to Abraham, and God is laying out his plans before Abraham. His plans for Abraham's family, but also consulting with him about Sodom and Gomorrah. God himself came to earth and talked with Abraham about what he was going to do there. And they had a conversation about it. There was relationship that was had there. And James talks about this as well. James says, And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Abraham was called a friend of God. Relationship, intimacy. Now let's look at Moses. Before they built the tabernacle, there was a tent of meeting. And this was the place that God's presence would come. It would come in a pillar. At night it would be a pillar of fire, and the day it would be a pillar of smoke. And so Moses would set this, tabernacle, this uh, tent of meeting up, and he would go there. And Exodus 33 talks about this. It says, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Again, as a man speaks to his friend. And then you see Joshua as well, who would be the next leader of Israel, would stay there and continue to converse with God. As a man speaks with his friend is how he would talk to Moses. Do you want that with God? Do you want that type of relationship? Moses isn't special. He literally killed a guy. <laughs> um, he was kept out of the promised land because of his anger. When he broke the rock into, when he wasn't supposed to, that was what kept him out of the promised land because he wasn't obedient. 
He was, he, he's not this perfect man, and yet he was called a friend of God. And then David. David, that, I didn't pick a scripture because there's so many scriptures that highlight this fact about how David's relationship was with God. God calls him a man after his own heart. And I think part of that comes from his years and years on his own as a shepherd in the field with the sheep and his, and his harp, writing songs for God, talking with him, building that relationship, and 10 years on the run from Saul, hiding in caves. He had his men with him, but it was precious time that he spent with God. It reminds me, after I, um, after I became a Christian, I became a Christian at the end of my freshman year of college. And then in between my sophomore and junior year, I went on my first mission trip with uh, Campus Crusade, which is called Crew Now. Uh, and I was in Vail, Colorado for the whole summer. Uh, I know, really suffering for the Lord. Um, I, uh, I worked as, not as a valet at the Vail Marriott. I worked at the Vail Marriott, but I wasn't the valet. I was the guy that drove the valets to and from the parking lot. So I was sitting in this, they rented two Ford Explorers that they didn't take care of. So it was like constantly breaking down. It would like, the power steering would go out while I was driving and I have to like turn the car off, pop it in neutral, turn the car back on, put it back in drive and keep going. And I just had to do that probably about five times a day. Um, but I would drive people to and the valets when they were dropping a car off, I'd go pick them up. When they were needing to pick up a car, I'd take them to the parking lot. Uh, and I did that almost every day for three months from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. And they're not always, I'm not driving the whole time. I'm spending a lot of time just sitting in that car. And when I'm sitting in that car by myself, I'm listening to Air One, which if you don't know what that is, it's like K-Love, but for edgy people. Um, <laughs> and so I, like, I listened to those same 15 songs for like three months on Air One, just and just getting getting the spirit of the Lord, you know? And, and I was reading my Bible. I had my Bible with me. Uh, every day I was there, and I was just pouring through that Bible, just reading as much as I can. I'd been a Christian for a year, and I'd started to read a bit, but that summer um, is where I developed my love for the Word. And it's where I had constant, constant connection with the Lord. And, and on, on my days off, I'd, most of the time I'd uh, take my hammock, and walk up, there's this trail back behind where we were staying, and I'd hike two or three miles out where I couldn't hear the highway anymore, and set up my hammock and just spend the day with the Lord. And that was such a precious time for me, and it, and it set me up for the relationship that I have with him now, that time of just constant, constant communion, connection with God. That was, this is God's plan all along that we would speak to him as a friend. There is more for us than, as Paul says, just barely escaping the flames. There's a plan for us to have intimate relationship with him. That's what we're called to. So let's bring it to the New Testament. Let's talk about it, what, what it looks like now. Jesus says in John 15, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. In this section, which is, which is a part of a, of a longer passage, Jesus says abide four times. And he says it even more in the rest of the passage. Abide. That is what he is calling us to do, to abide in him to have intimacy with him. The vine, Jesus calls himself the vine. The vine is the entire plant. The grapevine, it's not, it's not there's a vine and then there's other bits and there's other bits. No, the vine references the entire plant and the branches are just part of that. 
So when he says that we, he is the vine and we are the branches, he's not saying we're two separate entities. He's saying that we are one. When we become a Christian and we follow him, we become one with him. We get grafted onto the vine as a branch. And works are important. Works are important. There, there, there's, there is a place for that. Jesus says that if you love me, you obey my commandments. He gives us commandments of things to do, things not to do, ways, ways to act, ways to think. He, he gives us things that are works. But the works are the fruit of the relationship. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. Our identity is not in the works. Our identity is in the abiding. Because the works are a fruit of the relationship. And they're not even our fruit. They're still God's fruit. Because the branch doesn't produce the fruit. The vine does. Jesus produces the fruit through us. So if we find our identity in works, which is common, it's silly because it's not even your works. <laughs> you, like you kind of did it, but it's really from God. It is God that does it. So we need to find our identity there. It's not our fruit. We cannot defeat sin in our life. We cannot affect uh, our community, our families. We cannot make a dent in the kingdom, for the kingdom, unless we abide. Because relationship is always evidenced by fruit. On the flip, works are not always indicative of relationship. And Jesus talks about that in Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Relationship is always evidenced by fruit, but works or fruit are not always indicative of a relationship. Someone can say, Lord, Lord, and not know him. So our identity, our salvation, is not based in works, but in relationship as children of God. That is where our identity is based, and that's where we, we need to turn. This is, this is always true, but especially in this time where identity is such an important thing, people are grasping for identity. Everyone is. Everyone is trying to figure out who they are our culture doesn't necessarily provide a clear answer to that. There's, there's no homogenous answer to who we are, the way that it's presented. You can be, you, your identity is not solid. That's what our culture says. And so this, this, this is so important to understand where our identity is, that our identity, identity is in Christ and in Christ in that intimacy that we have with him. That is where our identity comes from, is our relationship with him. This was the whole purpose of the cross. Matthew 27, Jesus is on the cross. And it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The whole purpose of the cross was intimacy. When Jesus yielded up his spirit, the curtain in the temple was torn. The curtain separated the Holy of Holies, the place where God's presence resided. That was when the tabernacle was put together. It was, it was, part of it was because the Israelites couldn't be in his presence as sinful people. And so God relegated himself to the Holy of Holies. And when that curtain was torn, it was signifying that he was no longer doing that, that he was going to come and live with us and live in us, that that is the end goal. If God's purpose was just to do works through us, he didn't need to suffer on the cross. 
there are so many examples in the Old Testament of the Holy Spirit coming upon people. The Holy Spirit was coming upon David. The Holy Spirit came upon Saul. When you look at the, the story of the creation of the tabernacle, there's two men that the Holy Spirit comes upon to give them the talents they need to build the tabernacle. The purpose was not to just equip us for works. Because you could already do that. The purpose was intimacy. Intimacy with God. That's the more. That's, that's what God has for each and every single one of us. And no matter where you are at with that, if you have a very strong relationship with the Lord, there's more. There's always more. My relationship with Hannah can always grow more. So let's get practical. Let's get practical, practical. The first thing that we can do with this is we can make it a point to spend time with God. Just a, at least a little bit of time every day. Like I've talked about, one of the most frequent analogies is marriage that God uses. And a few weeks ago, Guy and Jen shared about um, that weekend to remember thing that they went to. And one of the things they said was that you're always growing together or apart. At every moment, you're either growing closer together or further apart. And that's how our relationship with God is. At every moment, we can be coming closer to him or we can be going further away. Invest time in your relationship with God. And there's lots of ways that, that can look. So I'm, I, I don't have any prescriptions for that. Um, it could be, you know, you're spending part of your time every morning. Maybe you just can't think at all in the morning. <laughs> so it's at night. Uh, maybe it's sitting on your front porch. Maybe it's locking yourself in a closet. Maybe it's going for a hike. You know, there's, there's no clear way of, of this is how you have to do it. You got to find the th ways that you connect with God. And that's a, lot of, that's a lot of experimentation. That's a lot of trying things out. So that's the first thing we can do. We can spend time with him. The second thing is when we're doing things for God, because works are important, when we're doing things for him, remember that we're not doing them just for him. We're doing them with him. Because remember, the, f the fruit is from God. So God is doing them through us. And so as we're doing good works for him, remembering to pray before we do it, like, God, come, come work through me. In the moment, while you're doing it, remember that God is side by side with you doing this. And remember to give him the glory and to enjoy him while you're doing it. Works don't have to feel like work. <laughs> because if you're doing it with someone you love, right? When you're doing something that's not your favorite, if you're doing it with someone that you love, someone you get along with really well, uh, it's awesome. It's a fun time. So remember that while you're doing things with God. So we spend time with him. We remember him while we're doing the things he's called us to do. And I think the last thing I want to talk about real briefly is so, uh, another thing we can do is communion. And Pastor Guy is going to come up here in a minute and, and administer communion, but communion is is in its essence, a form of intimacy with God. As we partake in, in the bread and the grape juice, um, remembering what he has done for us and that he is here with us and that he always will be. Communion is, is a really great way to connect with him and continue to build that intimacy. So, Guy, why don't you come on up? And then you got this really sober, intelligent, diligent discipleship director we've got here who's going to really... You guys, the vision of this church is to equip you for the world. Equip the saints. That's what we do. And so um, you're going to be really impressed with what we're doing uh, as we roll out some stuff in the fall. But Sean and I and some of the other leaders were meeting. We realized before we ask you to do anything, 
out in the world and actually talk to those big bad sinners out there that we are <laughs> just like, right? We're going to remind you that you are wonderfully made. And we can do all we can do to do that by telling you all the scriptures that we machine gunned with you, that I shot you with for the last uh, three weeks. But it's only God, what Sean's sharing, and I know you heard it, is it's only God that can imprint upon you who you are. Today is Trinity Sunday in the church tradition. You're like, what does that mean? We have a threefold God. Do you know that? You know that he's the, so I'm not going to try to explain the Trinity to you that much. But as we take communion, I do want you to consider something. All being, ontology, being, all being, don't worry, this isn't going to be a whole nother sermon. All being communicates. It communicates. When I, if I, le let's take the lowest, now Howard, you can't listen to this. I'm not talking about quarks and scientific subatomic particles. I'm talking about a rock in the sand makes an impression, doesn't it? When you pick, if you throw it through a window, it makes another. And everything that has being communicates. And as you go up the hierarchy of being, right, a, a plant produces itself because the seed is intelligent enough to do that. You go higher, mammals produce babies. You with me so far? As we go up as humans, did you know that you can actually create an image of yourself? I'm not talking about kids, we know that. But I'm talking about, I don't know what I was thinking when I did that, right? What was I think? You can actually look back at yourself, right? In your, you can take a mental impression of yourself and say, gosh, when I was um, 17, I can't believe I did that. I can look back at myself. As you go up, there's more image bearing and it becomes more internal. There couldn't be anything deeper for me to talk about right now, but bear with me, you ready? When you get to God, the ultimate of all being from which everything flows, including the little potluck bite we're gonna have in just a moment, I will tell you that when you get to God, he has an image that he bears too, that he's impressing upon you. And Jesus Christ is the perfect image of God. See, when we bear an image, the imprint of the rock is not the same as the rock. But when you go higher up the higher, Abby's not the same as me, thank goodness, she's 2.0. But there's still some similarity. But once you get to the God level, the highest level of being, and we're about to partake of communion, which is his own being. Once you get to that level, God says, I'm his progeny. He, he generates his son from himself, which the Bible says is a perfect representation of God. God became man completely and utterly. And then God gave up his life as a man for you and I. And so when we take communion, he said, unless you eat my body, you have no part of me. Greg, you can pass that out. You have no part in me. And so today is communion Sunday for us because we moved it forward. But also it's potluck Sunday. And we're going to go eat whatever y'all brought next door and and we're going to have a good time. But right now, he says, you need to eat spiritually of me. You need to let my impression be pressed upon you. By the way, it is Trinity Sunday. I've only mentioned the Father and the Son. What about the third person? And the reason I'm brought up that we can look at ourselves, I don't know if I lost you, but I'm going to keep going, is that we can look back and say, I don't know what I was thinking then. But it doesn't mean there's two persons. It's still both you. Same thing with God. Three people in one. Three persons in one. Thomas Aquinas says the reason we call them persons is because we have no better word. But the reason this is so important is because every aspect of who you are, the hidden parts that you don't think God wants to see, he already sees. That's why Sean preached on intimacy. Into me see. I have this strange feeling some of you are getting me. So here's what I'm getting at. The third person, the Holy Spirit. Fulton Sheen used to say, when the Father 
looks at the perfect image of himself, the son, they fall in love. And they breathe self-love, the righteous kind, out towards each other. I love that this is too deep. It's okay. And guess what's going on? When the father looks at the son, he says, ah. And when the son looks at the father, he says, ah. Because they're completely and totally and utterly complete. The stock market goes up and down. People are born and die. Houses are erected and fall. Waves come in and out. Stars even die. But you know what never dies? Is God. He's complete and utterly complete in his threeness, in his oneness. Isn't that interesting? And what this is about today is when you take communion, you are becoming part of that eternal I don't think it was the wisest thing for me to talk about Trinity right now, but I'm going to finish. It's the complete and utter absorption into the reality of God. You're not alone. Christ died to bring you into the Trinity is my point. He died to bring you into that ultimate impression. So no longer is Tandy's father the only thing that's imprinting upon him. Now he says yes to Jesus, and the ultimate source, God himself, is now impressed upon you when you enter in to what he said. I'm going to have to preach that over a, sermon, over a season, but I just want to throw it out there because whether you heard me or you heard me, there's something that happens when we say, God there's a mystery about why you came down and how you became man. And I don't understand it all. How many of you understand exactly the way your car works? But you drive it. Well, right now when we break this bread, I simply say, God, I can't figure out your mystery. I just explained it, but I don't know what that means. I know that there is you God the Father, I know that there is you, God the Son, and I know that the love between you two is the Holy Spirit. And I know that when I said yes to you, your Holy Spirit took up residence inside of me. And as I exercise my faith and do what you said, you said, do this in memory of me, that you have no part in me unless you receive my body and my blood. And something supernatural happens. I don't know about you, but I've explored the natural. I could use a little super in my natural. Father, thank you for your beautiful outpouring of your Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And thank you that you are always emanating your spirit into our lives. Sin separates, Sean said. But Father, you paid for our sins through the blood of your son, Jesus. And as you are three in one, we want to enter into your unity, true harmony and true unity. And the only way we can do it is through faith. And so we lift up this bread just like you did on that day. And you said, Take this bread, Father, and bless it. You broke it, and you said, this is my body, broken for you, so that you may become whole. And so whatever area you need wholeness, shalom, healing, peace, receive it now, the body of Christ. The Bible says that when supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks and praise. And he said, do this in memory of me. This is the blood of the everlasting covenant shed for you. See, he said it was an everlasting covenant. And he said, as you drink this blood and receive this saving cup, you are now mine. He's saying bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now, I don't know about you, but I got some parts of me that like to stray outside of the ranch. But as I drink this, I trust the shepherd to pull me back in the blood of Christ. Father God, thank you for this church. Thank you for the courage and the boldness to make the shift from being sedentary to being a threshing sledge in your hand. 
Father, shoot us out like arrows into this community. I'm so weary and tired of watching people turn and suffer in the dark, thinking there's no way out. But God, you have commissioned everyone in this room to be a way maker. You're the ultimate way maker, but you are the one that will put your word on our tongue, even the slightest word. I thank you for the message, the truth that Sean gave us that filled our tank, that's saying, push in, push in. Now is the time. Now is the time. Father, help us get over our own little problems. Help us get over our own little insecurities and worries that keep us from sharing your light because you are the light of the world. I thank you even now for what you're doing in our hearts. I thank you that these folks got up today, showered most of them, and came here to seek you. I pray that they wouldn't go home empty-handed, that they would know how pleased you are with them, and that you would give them the desires of their heart like your word says. Because when we take care of your business, you take care of ours. And so, Father, we're about your business. Bless this church. Continue to pour out this new wind that you've blown on this church. As you grow it, we pray the walls will come down and we'll expand even more. But we're so grateful for what you've done, not just in our individual lives, but what you're doing among us. God, give these folks the desires of their heart. The scripture says, if we delight in you, Lord, you will give us our desi the desires of our heart. And so do that, Jesus. We delight in you now. I'm going to release you. But I, I just want to say a biblical prayer over you. Father in heaven, holy is your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. On earth, right here on earth as it is in heaven, your will in heaven come on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us this day for our trespasses. Give us our daily bread and lead us away. Lead us not into temptation. Lead us away from it. And deliver everyone in this room from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. I pray that his face would shine upon you. I pray that you would have new strength this week and that you would be renewed like the eagle, that you would sense something fresh in your spirit and that he would feed you with encouragement. No matter what the news is broadcasting, you would hear his voice and that everyone in this room would begin to hear God at a new level and that their intimacy would increase as we pray for one another for where he's taking us. Thank you so much for this blessed family, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I love Thanks for tuning in today. If you were blessed by this message at all, then be a blessing and give to the work of the Lord at eldoradochurch.org.